Hello, today we are going to be talking about topic 1.2 in the APUSH curriculum, Native American Societies Before European Contact. As usual, I want to um, first look at what your objective is for this lesson. You want to explain how and why various Native populations in the period before European contact interacted with the natural environment in North America. So a pretty broad objective here, looking at um, trying to become more specific on how a few Native American populations had specific interactions with their Native environment. So as far as the um, curriculum framework goes, uh, there's one, um, one point for each of the four regions that the APUSH curriculum emphasizes. So there's an emphasis on maize cultivation in Mexico and the present day American Southwest with some specific examples that we'll talk about. And then it has three other regions. It has the uh, Great Basin and Great Plains, um, talking about the aridity of the land and the mobile lifestyles the Northeast, the Mississippi River Valley and Atlantic seaboards. It's gonna focus on that mixed agriculture and hunter-gatherer economies. And then the, the Northwest and present day California, hunting and gathering and using the resources of the ocean. So those are kind of like your um, broad key ideas. And we're gonna dig into those ideas a little bit more. But before we dig into that, we are going to talk about what's called the peopling of North America. So how did the people arrive in North America? Who were the first Americans? We'll do some regional comparison. We'll look at one common belief amongst um, most Native American groups. So before we dive in, I want to um, do a quick note about the terminology. So when referring to um, Native Americans, most people would refer to, uh, would prefer to be referred to by their tribes, whether that's Cherokee or Navajo. But when we're talking about a larger group of people, um, different groups vary in what they prefer. American Indian, indigenous, it kind of is based on what region you're in. So since the preferences vary, I am going to use the terms interchangeably, um, but probably will lean most towards American Indian since that's the preferred term um, where I live. So when talking about the peopling of North America, we're going to look really briefly at two American Indian stories regarding who the first man and woman were. So the Shasta believed that the old man above bored a hole through the sky and came down to plant the first trees, create birds and fish and animals, and then lived in his teepee. And the Zuni was more focused on the sun. Uh, the sun was lonely and said for people below who lived uh, below the ground and invited them to come live in the sunlight and gave them corn. So many different groups have their own stories um, that have been kept alive through the generations about who the first people were. Um, and historians and anthropologists also have their own explanations. So we're going to start by talking about the theory that is most likely found in your APUSH book, the Bering Land Bridge Theory. Um, it's talking about how during the most recent ice age, um, when an ice age happens, the, the water from the oceans is more concentrated in the glaciers. And so the sea levels actually are much lower. So the theory is that there was a land bridge, an area of the ocean where the sea level actually was non-existent. And so um, people were able to cross from Siberia over to Alaska. And they didn't know they were crossing to a new continent because it was just land. Um, and then when the ice age ended and the glaciers melted, the area filled with water and then peoples would not have been able to get back. So then, the migration would have continued through the continent, um, uh, southward following plants, animals, migrating, um, and they would adapt to their environments as they encountered new, new places with different natural resources. Now, this is a theory, and it's the, why I addressed it is because it's the one that's most likely found in your AP book. Um, however, Many Native American groups don't subscribe to this theory. Um, they, they believe that others may have crossed the oceans uh, by boat. Um, it's, it's difficult to know for certain what happened. Um, 
but we do know that there are some connections between the peoples of Siberia and uh, the first Americans. So here's a quote by Professor Ned Eckhock of Yale University. He says, as far too many Indian people know too well, simplistic assumptions of a uniform Indian experience pervade popular culture and challenging students to recognize and reformulate such received knowledge remains essential, particularly because the legacies of conquest have so often been rationalized with and accompanied by monolithic and dehumanizing caricatures. So this is really the point of this lesson is to not create a uniform or a singular Native American experience, but rather to look at American Indians as individual groups that had immense differences um, and bring more light to a topic that um, really wasn't addressed in American history um, classrooms and most American history classrooms until the last 40 years. Um, American history really be used to begin with people who weren't Americans, Europeans. And so um, it's within the last 40 years that this field has really become um, more well known and has changed the way that history, um, early American history has been taught. So in general, um, American Indian groups are incredibly diverse. Before the arrival of Europeans, there were approximately 500 to 600 independent societies. They had various approaches to economics, their um, religious um, attitudes and beliefs, their family structures, all were very diverse and mostly tribal. Um, but we do see some regional similarities. So due to climate, due to natural resources, we see um, certain areas having some similarities that allow us to have some more broad understandings. Uh, there is a over how many Native Americans were on the continent prior to European contact, but it's likely estimates, you know, estimates range from 50 to 100 million, which would be as many or more than the populations of Europe and Africa, but less so than Asia. So as late as 1987, the American History of Survey, a standard high school textbook by three well-known historians, described the Americas before Columbus as empty of mankind and its works. The story of Europeans in the New World, the book explained, is the story of the creation of a civilization where none exists. And this is just flat out incorrect. Um, we know that mankind existed on the continent and there was civilization there. So in this brief lesson, we're going to give you some examples of that um, so that you can counter this idea of an empty continent that was colonized or even that it was discovered. So according to your AP curriculum, these are the four regions that we are going to be looking at. So Mexico and the American Southwest will be our first region. We're going to look at the Great Plains and the Great Basin. And then we're going to shift over here to the eastern half of the present day United States. And then we'll look at the far west coast. So if you want to, you know, pause the video and create this chart, you sure can. Um, we're going to be looking at the four regions. We're going to look at the peoples that existed there, the economic activities, some social cultural practices, and other characteristics. Now, I want to make sure that I um, emphasize again that these are going to be generalizations that won't be true for all groups or each person within a group, but are generally true for the region based on the environment. Um, Additionally, there's no way to do justice to this topic in one video. Um, you really need a full class on just um, American Indians to fully appreciate and understand the diversity that existed. Um, but we're going to try to dive in as best we can in this short video. So starting off with the, um, with Mexico and the American Southwest, um, you can see a list of groups there. Now, Inca has a star because the Inca were really located more in South America. However, we're part of that initial conquest by the Spanish, so that's why I included them there. So what we see is incredibly advanced cultures here, um, so advanced that uh, the major capital city of the Aztec Empire, Tenochtitlan, had over 200,000 people that lived there. So these had, there were incredibly large cities, um, 
with well-developed governmental structures, well-developed um, uh, social strat stratification, um, as well as small communities. Um, this is considered to be, uh, some people call it the heart of the pre-Columbian world. So um, where the most advanced civilizations existed. Uh, this area is known by its cultivation of maize or corn and the wide variety of types of corn that they were able to create and how that allowed for more permanent civilizations because they had a stable food supply. Um, additionally, you can see that there were some advancements in written language, calendar, math, there were 25,000 miles of roads and bridges in the Inca Empire. So this really isn't that empty, uncivilized world that was referenced in that textbook from the late 1980s. Oh, and irrigation. We have to mention irrigation. Uh, irrigation is going to be the, uh, an extensive agricultural system that allows for water to be transported from one area to another, which allowed for that cultivation of crops. So moving on to the Great Basin and the Great Plains, um, this is an area that most people um, characterize with teepee living, with um, dependence on the bison, um, incredibly mobile lifestyles. And some of that is true, um, but a lot of that did develop after the arrival of Europeans with the introduction of the horse, um, or with the, not necessarily the introduction of the horse, but the popularization of the horse. And so, um, because it is such a dry area, having a um, extensive agricultural system was challenging in most of the region, um, which left um, smaller communities, ones that wouldn't have to have as much uh, as many people to supply food for. And additionally, there were there was more movement based on um, where the animals were located and following them. So for the most part, they were largely mobile and nomadic. But there were some that were more sedentary, and that would, could have been based on seasons. So in some seasons, they may have been able to have some additional agriculture or hunting and gathering that would allow them to stay in one place for a longer period of time. Looking at this huge area um, of our eastern half of the United States, um, one of the main regions that is on here is the Mississippi River Valley, which is also known as the Great Nautical Highway. Um, lots of various groups here with very different ways of life. You can think about how different living in, say, uh, New York would be to live in Florida. And so um, putting this region into one um, group is difficult um, to come up with generalizations. But um, when we think about, especially, say, the Northeast and the Mississippi River Valley, um, we think about the three sister farming. So three sister farming is something that is a term that references the three crops, squash, bean, and corn. Um, who And those three crops, when they are grown together, actually thrive um, and do better when they're planted together. So um, that is a, one of the major characteristics of a lot of groups in this area. There were some uh, very large settled communities, up to 2,000 people. Um, Cahokia and the Mound Builders is seen as one of the most advanced um, groups of people initially. Um, some of these groups are more matrilineal. So we see the female leadership um, in hunter-gatherer economies. The men would be more of the hunters and they would sometimes be away for weeks or months. And so that left the women to run the society. And so we do see that female leadership being more characteristic of these areas. Um, additionally, the Iroquois Confederacy is going to come up again in period two of the A-Push curriculum. And this is going to be an alliance of group, um, various groups who have not only a more common language, but also some common practices and agreed upon ideas. And so that Confederacy is going to end up being more important in our next unit. Uh, but this is the region where they're from. And then our last region uh, to reference here is the Northwest in California. And this is where we see the most diverse ethnographic communities. There are so many different peoples who lived in this region. Uh, 
But for many of them, especially those along the coast, um, there were abundant natural resources, um, salmon, fish, berries, all kinds of um, things that made eating fairly um, uh, dependable. And so what that allowed was for a larger amount of leisure time. So we see a lot of sculpting, painting, uh, beadwork, a lot of that coming from this region where areas who had a less dependable food source and had to spend much more of their time obtaining food uh, would not have had the same type of leisure time that these areas would have had. So to contradict the statement um, from the American History textbook from the 1980s, here's another quote by Professor Blackhawk. At the heart of this content, continent then, at the time of European expansion into the Americas, large indigenous communities resided in comparable form to those found, not necessarily in central Mexico itself, but across much of Mesoamerica and the Caribbean, making the native North American world one of the most densely inhabited, deeply interconnected, and vibrant cultural, economic, and political activity. These mythologies that have been handed down from throughout the generations of American history that Native Americans were nomadic and that they lacked the capacity for urbanization or agriculture, that they live wandering nomadic lives, that they were somehow inherently wedded to primitive forms of sociality. So it's really um, important to understand that the Native Americans that lived in North America prior to European continent uh, contact. We're not just teepee living, bison hunting, small groups primitive, but rather they were incredibly advanced, um, interconnected, had long, long trade networks, and had very vibrant cultures as well. So that's quite different than some of the ideas that have been passed down um, throughout history. So one common belief that I do want to address is the idea of animism. You might see that as well. And this is the idea that the supernatural was com a complex and diverse web of power woven into every part of the natural world. And so what a lot of people do is they take this thought and they believe that American Indians um, were the first environmentalists, you know, that they uh, kept everything perfectly natural. And it is true that they believe that living things were connected. You can think of the, um, you know, lyrics from the Pocahontas song, um, Colors of the Wind, and how uh, they believe that every life has a spirit, has a name. You know, I think those are the lyrics. Um, but that didn't mean that they didn't change their environment. In fact, they deeply impacted their environment. You can think about the irrigation that I briefly mentioned from Mesoamerica. Um, there they engaged in um, slash and burn agriculture where they would burn down the forest. Um, and so they deeply impacted their environment and made the environment work for them. But there was the idea of reciprocity. They can claim a share of the life around them, but they must reciprocate and pay honor, minimize waste. And so they did care for the environment more than many other cultures did but that didn't mean they was completely left alone. Instead, they made it work for them and reciprocated. And so that's where we do see in some cultures more the um, example of human sacrifice or um, paying attention to the gods, you know, believing that the sun god or the rain god had a certain effect based on um, whether their actions were honorable or not. So it's important not to confuse animism with um, a harmonious, environmental attitude, but rather understand uh, that they did impact their environment, but also reciprocated. So thinking back on your key objective here, explain how and why various native populations in the period before European contact interacted with the natural environment in North America. I would think about um, each of the four groups we mentioned and try to have one specific way that the group um, changed or altered their environment or that their lifestyle was impacted by the environment. So that should help you with enough specificity to answer this key concept.